Thank you for joining us today for another presentation of Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. Welcome to Let the Bible Speak. What goes through your mind when you hear the word holy? Many people think about the 200-year-old hymn by Reginald Heber. Holy, holy, holy. Though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see, only thou art holy. There is none beside thee, perfect in power and love and purity. Others think of some super Christian they know. Still others may think of cathedrals, synagogues, and temples. How many Christians, though, think of personal obligation in the context of holiness? Yet this is exactly what the scriptures on holiness point to you. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 through 16, we read the following. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you with the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. We can only scratch the surface on this topic today, but this discussion benefits anyone truly seeking to please God. Holy people for our holy God after our song. Holy. holy, although found 567 times in the Bible, has been left behind by Christendom. Leviticus is the book most dominated by the discussion of holiness, but this topic is covered throughout the Old and New Testaments. The biblical emphasis on holiness has been supplanted today by words and phrases completely absent from Scripture, like personal relationship, seeker-sensitive, and relevant. Why is the subject of holiness neglected? Is it because holiness suggests self-discipline and obedience, while popular religious terms suggest God's tacit approval for one just kind of doing his own thing? One reason for the waning emphasis on holiness is the association with the phrase, holier than thou. Nobody wants this label. And certainly, one may aim for holiness but miss the mark and develop the arrogant attitude that Jesus condemned in the Pharisees. The word translated Pharisees is, in fact, very similar to the word holiness. The Hebrew words for Pharisee, parash, and holy, kadash, both mean separate. So what's the difference? Thayer says the Pharisees sought for distinction and praise by outward observance of external rites and by outward forms of piety and comparatively negligent of genuine piety, they prided themselves on their fancied good works. They were severely rebuked by Jesus for their avarice, ambition, hollow reliance on outward works 
and affection of piety in order to gain popularity. Oh, yeah. They were distinct and separate, but in a perverted way that sorely displeased God. International Standard Bible Encyclopedia provides further insight. Quote, there were said to be seven classes of Pharisees mentioned in the Talmud. In all but the last, there was an element of acting, of hypocrisy. The so-called shoulder Pharisee, who wears his good deeds on his shoulders and obeys the precept of the law, not from principle, but from expediency. Then there was the wait a little Pharisee, who begs for time in order to perform a meritorious action. The bleeding Pharisee, who in his eagerness to avoid looking on a woman, shuts his eyes and so bruises himself to bleeding by stumbling against a wall. And then there's the painted Pharisee who advertises his holiness lest anyone should touch him so that he should be defiled. Jesus called them all hypocrites because although there were exceptions, as a rule, they only pretended to be holy. Their focus was on their supposed superiority to their fellow man instead of their own inferiority to God and their need for continued personal growth. They were hypocritical of everyone, everyone but themselves. They gave themselves a pass. They fixated on externals and as a rule had stony hearts. They decided what laws were mandatory and which were not. Jesus excoriated them in Matthew 23, verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of men and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. They couldn't see the forest for the trees. They had difficulty cultivating truly holy hearts. We must avoid this distortion of holiness and restore the word holy to its biblical place. Consider how central the word holy is to the climax of the Apostle Paul's epistle to the church at Rome. I think it's easy to miss this. Romans 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The Spirit, through the Apostle, laid the foundation, adding brick after brick to his argument throughout the book of Romans, then saying climactically, in light of all I've written about God's goodness and the great indebtedness of both Jew and Gentile, please offer your body on the altar. No more does God look for animal sacrifices. He expects me to have flesh in the game. God no longer wants merely what belongs to me. He wants me and he wants all of me. Surely he is worthy of complete surrender. We cannot be content with a minimums mentality when it comes to living for our holy God. We must be holy, holy. And just as God expected the Levitical offerings to be without spot and blemish, he expects me to be consecrated as well. This leads, Romans 12, 2, to resisting the mold the world tries to squeeze me into as the world tries to make me into a carbon copy of everyone around me. Being holy means being transformed, not conformed. It means rising above, not blending in by suppressing the flesh and empowering the spirit. Holiness is the central idea here and of course, is the opposite of worldliness. Think about it. 
When did you last say, you know, God expects me to be holy? I will be holy. But keeping this idea at the forefront of our minds will transform our decision making. Consider how running our lives through a holiness filter would impact how we live, what we say and how we say it, what we listen to, what we watch and how we look at it, how we dress and how we carry ourselves, how we view ourselves and others, how often we pray and read God's word, how we worship God and how often, who we surround ourselves with and how we treat others. Clearly, for those serious about eternal life, holiness is not optional. In fact, Hebrews 12, verse 14, the Bible says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. The Spirit says, We cannot go to heaven without pursuing peace and holiness. This word pursue is interesting. It's follow in the King James Version and literally means to run swiftly in order to catch a person or thing, to run after, to press on, figuratively of one who in a race runs swiftly to reach the goal. So we can't be nonchalant about holiness. Sluggishness and dragging around is disallowed in the holiness department. Our attitude toward holiness must not be typified by crawling, walking, or jogging, but by sprinting, going wide open, chasing, pursuing, running after. How much effort am I putting into holy living? Pursuing holiness implies ongoing exertion, keeping our foot on the gas, never becoming complacent or satisfied, but pressing forward. What am I pursuing? You know, we're all pursuing something. Is this something holiness or something else? We must be holy, but what does that mean? We read about the holy God, the Holy Spirit, holy angels, the holy city, the holy place, the most holy place, a holy name, holy prophets, holy covenant, holy scriptures, a holy calling, holy conduct, holy faith, and more. But what is the definition of holy? The word holy is synonymous with unique, special, set apart, different, distinct. You see, the word holy is the opposite of common, mundane, everyday, casual, ordinary, regular, run-of-the-mill. Think of the phrase, fine china. Paper plates are common every day, while fine china is unique, extra special, set apart for use on special occasions. Are you living like God's fine china? The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Timothy 2, verse 20, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified. And that word sanctified means set apart as holy and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Pursuing holiness means not being satisfied with mediocrity. Holiness is a wedding dress. Holiness is Mount Everest at six miles high. When we say God is holy, we mean that he is in a place all by himself. There is no one like God. He is without peers. A.W. Tozer puts it this way, we know nothing like the divine holiness. It stands apart, unique, unapproachable, incomprehensible, and unattainable. The natural man is blind to it. He may fear God's power and admire his wisdom, but his holiness he cannot even imagine. The prophet is confronted by God's holiness in Isaiah 6, verse 1. And this gives us an idea of just how special God's holiness is. In the year that King Isaiah died, Isaiah writes, I saw the Lord sitting 
on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. With two, he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. The righteous, courageous prophet of God is utterly humiliated and intimidated by God's holiness. No man in Israel was more righteous. If anyone could endure God's presence, it was Isaiah. And yet before the majesty of the holy God, he was overcome by self-loathing. Woe is me, for I am undone. The New American Standard has, I am ruined. The English Standard, I am lost. The New Living Translation, my destruction is sealed. The New Century Version, oh no, I will be destroyed. The message from Isaiah in the midst, in the presence of the Lord, I am so out of place. What? Am I doing here? Note that Isaiah offered no casual, irreverent, Hi, Dad. Hey, buddy. No, no. Instead, we see the ultimate respect due such an otherworldly experience and the holy God. Oh, there were no negotiations either. No setting aside of the covenant to work out his own covenant, his own arrangement with God. What was so awe-inspiring about God? A.J. Trowley writes, It is not the consciousness of humanity in presence of divine power, but the consciousness of sin in the presence of perfect moral purity. Listen, anytime we approach God or that which is holy, the realization of our own impurity and insignificance should overwhelm us and make us anxious to submit to him. Isaiah went on to say, I'm a man of unclean lips. This word unclean is the word the leper used to ward anyone who might approach him. Isaiah only thought he knew God before this experience. So we should all view ourselves as spiritual lepers. When we begin to see God as he is, and ourselves as we are. A.W. Pink describes God's holiness, solitary in majesty, unique in his excellency, peerless in his perfection. No chink in the armor, no speck to contaminate, no blemish to taint. Perhaps Isaiah had this experience in mind when he wrote in Isaiah 64, verse 6. We are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. Nothing aids us in humility toward God and our fellow man like seeing God as he is. Isaiah's experience reminds me of how Jesus is set apart at the transfiguration. One of the places we read that is in Matthew 17. Look at verse 2. And Jesus was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as the light. Skipping down to verse five, a bright cloud overshadowed them and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. 
Another description is found in Mark 9, verse 3. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. You know, a number of godly men had the same experience that, and felt that same awe of being in God's presence. Judges 6, verse 22. When Gideon saw that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Judges 13, verse 22. So Manoah said to his wife, We will surely die, for we have seen God. Job 42, verse 5. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I retract and repent in dust and ashes. Luke 5, verse 8. Simon Peter fell down at Jesus' feet saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Then John in Revelation 1, 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. God preserved these passages so we too would be in awe, indirectly, of God's holiness, that we would recognize him as transcendent. God is holy. God is set apart. Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Look back at Isaiah 6. And the angelic words, holy, holy, holy. What is that all about? God is wise powerful, loving, merciful, forgiving. And these are special attributes. Yet no angel ever says in scripture, wise, 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 powerful, 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 loving, loving, loving. And that's not to lessen these attributes of God. For you see, God is holy precisely because he is omnipotent, omniscient, all merciful, mighty in love, perfect in purity, all rolled into one being. God's holiness is the sum of all his attributes. This is important because we often equate God's holiness with God's purity. 1 John 1 verse 5, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Oh, God's holiness includes purity, but it goes beyond that. Someone has spoken about ivory soap commercials promoting their product as 99 and 44 one hundredths percent pure. That's great for soap. I made it look good enough to pass for drinkable milk. But saying God is 99 and 44 percent, 44 one hundredths percent pure, that's an insult to God. Purity is only one important element of God's holiness. We must see God in his absolute holiness to properly motivate us in maintaining relative holiness. Our past sin and future sin 1 John 1, verse 8 through 10, prevent us from the lofty height of the absolute holiness that God occupies. Still, we are commanded in 1 Peter 1, 15, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Does any truth need to be trumpeted more widely? In our world, where those who claim to be Christians are ambivalent towards God's living. Oh, Paul wrote, 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. But he wasn't using this terminology to lower the bar and downplay his own sin. Paul used it to declare his personal humility and awareness of his sin. He wrote, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? I hope you enjoyed our study. On holiness. I hope you've been challenged. Stay with us and we'll let you know how you can get a copy of this message after our song.
Thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak. We hope you've heard God speak to you through his word. If you'd like a copy of today's message, 1367, Holy People for Our Holy God, or God is Holy, or to begin our free Bible study course, please contact us. Visit letthebiblespeak.com to review transcripts, hear audio, and watch videos. Finally, we echo the sentiment of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye, and may God bless you. We hope you've been challenged and encouraged by Bible teaching. We strive to speak the truth in love and aspire to help you make heaven your home. I have dear friends among congregations in your area committed to worshiping in spirit and in truth, John 4, verse 24. Know that when you visit, you will not be singled out or embarrassed, but will receive a warm welcome from caring Christians. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. We hope by God's providence to be an avenue through which you more fully live out the will of God. My dear friends near you are knowledgeable and approachable Bible teachers and would gladly meet with you to discuss the scriptures with an open Bible. Life is short, so short. James 4.14 says, Our life is like a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. We hope you see the urgency in doing all you can as soon as you can to make sure your life is right with God. Get the Let the Bible Speak app and visit letthebiblespeak.com for a wealth of biblical teaching. Call, text, or email, and we'll personally return each message you send to us.